Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining for today's very special interview with the one and only Flora Brooke Anthony, Dr. Flora Brooke Anthony, might I add. Flora is an Egyptologist. She is also an uh, art historian. Um, Flora studied, no, Flora teaches Egyptology at the Kennesaw University. I hope I said that right, Flora. Kennesaw State University. Yeah. Kennesaw State University. I was struggling with that name. Yeah. <laughs> she holds a PhD in Egyptian art and archaeology. Flora's main focuses are actually on Egyptian magic as well as foreigners in Egypt. Flora has been featured in several documentaries, including the science channels, um, Discovery Science Channels documentary series, Egypt's Unexplained Files, and a new one coming up on the Smithsonian Channel called Pyramids, Secrets of the Builders. Flora has also been featured in my documentary quite a lot um, about Queen Nefertari. We are both actually part of the Past Preservers Agency. So thank you so much for joining us today, Flora. Thanks for having me. I'm really glad to be here with you guys. It's so fun chatting to you. So I want to pick your brain about all kinds of topics. So uh, firstly, I'd like to know, where did you study Egyptology? Do you want to begin at the beginning? <laughs> let's, begin at the be let's begin at the beginning, a very good place to start. OK. Uh, let's see. I started, uh, I guess, in second grade. I read all the books, like most Egyptologists, I think. I read all the books in all the libraries as a kid. Um, set out to want to be an Egyptologist in second grade. Um, and then in high school, I started interning at the Carlo Carlos Museum, and that's where I got to meet all the mummies there that we were just discussing. Uh, I went off to Georgia State, did my undergraduate degree, studied uh, art history with Melinda Hartwig, and actually studied abroad at the American University in Cairo with Salima when she was working on her animal mummies project. Oh, um, fun. That must have been so interesting. It was a lot of fun. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's how I know her. She was my professor. <laughs> I've known her for ages. Yeah. Um, so, uh, after undergrad, I, I went back to the Carlos and uh, I told Gay that I really, really wanted to be a graduate student of hers, but she was not taking graduate students. So I figured it was a lost cause, but I might as well try, right? Like, what's, what's the worst thing that can happen for me? I um, asking. And I originally wrote Peter and Gay letters, I'd say in middle school, saying things like, I'd like to be an Egyptologist. How do, I, how do I get someone to mummify me when I die? You know, how can I build my own pyramid? I'm, I'm sure it was ridiculous stuff. Uh, those, are valid, wrote, those are valid questions. I, in my, in my master's program, I signed my body off to be mummified if I died in my master's program. So it was still valid. Fortunately, I'm still alive because I don't think my friend had the training yet. How anyway. Do you, wait, how do you do that? Can you sign oh. up off to be mummified? Well, your friend drafts, you know, they're most legalese, you know, should you die between the years of blank and blank, uh, you will allow me to, you know, mummify your corpse. Uh, and this will serve as the legal paperwork needed, you know, blah, blah, blah. I think she looked it up online. Okay. And so I just signed off and I was like, well, the likelihood of me dying during these two years is small and hey, I'll be gone. So what does it matter really? <laughs> <I'll be an experiment. laughs> um, but I didn't die in graduate school, which is good. I went to graduate school at um, the University of Memphis at the Institute of Egyptian Archaeology. Um, because Dr. Robbins says, said, why don't you go see if you like to do hieroglyphs first, then come back to me. Yeah. Uh, so I did that, and by the time I had done that, she had taken on a graduate student, and so uh, that that was my fate. I got to study with Gay at Emory University, and um, got my PhD, 
and that was my educational route. So I got to study with my favorite Egyptologist who I admired my whole life. It was yeah, wonderful. Kay Robinson. Wonderful. So it was a really good experience. Yeah. yeah. So what were you like as a student? <laughs> I think about this a lot because I occasionally have students that are like me. Um, and I feel, I feel a little bit bad for my professors. Um, were you that because, bad? What? Were you that bad? No, well, I had great intentions and lots of excitement. Um, but I did go visit my professors and just hang around and talk about whatever subject I was learning, kind of ad nauseum, and ignored office hours completely, which, yeah. <laughs> which as a professor now, I mean, that it seems like I should have at least followed that pro protocol. But, um, you know, many of my teachers are still, my, many of my professors from college are still in my life as very close friends and they know my children and we still hang out. Um, so I guess I didn't bother them too much, which is good. Uh, but I was just, you know, very eager. Oh, and I did this extraordinarily, extraordinarily neurotic, well, I did a lot of neurotic things, but one of the most neurotic things that I did was uh, at the first week of school, I would read ahead the first week and then I would mark all my calendars. So everything was, I was ahead a week the whole year and I only had to buckle down for the first weekend. Wow. And then I knew all the answers and all of the classes for the entire semester. I tell my students to do this because it'll give them a leg up. Not one of them has taken me up on it. <laughs> Surprisingly. I'm like, you only lose one weekend. Yeah. It's, yeah. You'll be the whole time. You'll get all A's. Your teacher will think you're brilliant. No, no one's taking me up on it. Well, that's a really good tip. So they should do that. It's a pro nerd tip. Yeah. Yeah, I used to be like that. I used to do my homework in class. I used to like, yeah. <laughs> did, you, did you different color highlight your, did you have a, a color coding? No, I, would, I never wrote in my, my textbooks. I was too, I was too protective over them. No one can borrow my books because it's all annotated and really annoying. <laughs> so. <laughs> so have you faced any obstacles in your career starting out as an Egyptologist? Oh, yes, so many. Um, well, <laughs> I'd say probably in second grade, I, uh, both of my parents went to Catholic schools and were raised Catholic. And uh, I kind of I, I kind of saw the pageantry and Catholicism and the ritual and the many, the pantheon of the saints as um, very similar to the Catholic um, religion. And so I just kind of switched them in second grade when I was learning about all the gods. And I was like, oh, dad, I now believe in the ancient Egyptian religion. <laughs> I. I don't okay. remember ever being spanked in my life, but I do remember being spanked on that day. Okay. So Which was the patron that, god that you were like, that's the one? Oh, <laughs> who was the patron of art in Catholicism or? Oh no, the one that you liked in Egyptology. Oh, wouldn't it be Knum for pottery and Ta for craftsman? Okay, okay. I believe choices. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would probably worship Ta. Also, he's also like one of the more intellectually sound gods, I think. Yes. I think academics would, would prefer him over the others as well. Yeah. Um, but they got, they kind of got used, they kind of got used to it. But when I told them I wanted to be an Egyptologist for a, a job as a living, um, of course that was not received well. Now they're happy that I get to do the thing that I've loved my whole life. Uh, but <laughs> it was very much frowned upon for a very long time. Oh, oh. So is that how you got involved in Egyptology, interested in Egyptology from school, from Catholicism? How did that happen? So it's kind of a funny story. And... Um, I'll be honest, I've, I don't... I've asked you this before and you've never given me a straight answer. So 
I'll give you, I'll give you guys the straight answer, but I don't, I haven't shared it a lot before, but here's the true story. So we have exclusive. So it's, it's, it's definitely an exclusive. Only a few students of mine have heard this. Um, I'm going to preface with the preface this with the fact that I'm not new agey. I'm not into dream interpretation. There's things though I appreciate that other people are into those things and I respect their beliefs. Yeah. Um, that said, when I was younger, I had a dream where I would go to ancient Egypt and visit the ancient Egyptian version of myself and then get my hair done and my makeup done and would walk around the town. Well, I had this dream uh, probably at once a week, maybe once every two weeks, my entire life okay. uh, until I went to Egypt. And so this is just something that everybody knew about me was that I had a reoccurring dream. Now, I don't, I mean, if I were to ascribe any meaning to this, I would say it just got stuck in my head in second grade when we were learning about ancient Egypt. And it just, I really liked it. And so I thought, what would, what would life be like if I lived there? And, and I just, I don't know, my brain got stuck there for a bit. Um, but that was it. It was, it was a dream that I had kind of constantly that guided my interest or my obsession with the ancient Egyptian world. That's, that's quite interesting, actually, that it sort of like came to you in a dream. In a very repetitive, reoccurring dream. Yeah, actually, the only thing that changed... Which city were you in in this dream? Hmm? Which city were you in in this dream? Oh, um, it wasn't location specific, but I would say Upper Egypt, if I, if I were to think critically about it. But, you know, it's just a dream. I don't take dreams very literally, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, we just walked around a little village together after I got my hair and hair and makeup done. And that was really, it was really about it. Her mom did her hair, my hair and makeup. The one thing that did change about the dream throughout time is that when I would go, uh, I would offer her my music listening device. And that changed from, this is going to give you kind of an idea of my age, uh, a Walkman to a CD player. Um, I don't think I, I went to Egypt when I was 19 and that's when the dream stopped. So I don't think I ever made it to uh, an iPod, but <laughs> weird story. <laughs> well, maybe it was like, once you visited Egypt, the dream was like, okay, she's here now. I can stop bugging her, so. Yeah, yeah, maybe like, um, okay, you made it. That was the goal. We're done now. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It was a sort of a little message, so. Perhaps yeah. a very persistent one. Exactly. But my my aunt, uh, rest her soul, she was very new agey. So she put all sorts of things on top of this this dream. You know, oh, you were reincarnated from a past life and blah. And but I'm like, I don't, I don't necessarily believe in that stuff. You know, so yeah, yeah. it was just a an interesting story. You know, throughout my childhood. Yeah, yeah. But it doesn't uh, inform my academics whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> There's no footnote, like as said, as came through dream. <laughs> so you're not, um, you're not Om Seti again. No, God, no. But she would have been such an interesting woman to meet. I know, I know. I think it's a very interesting story that. I'm just amazed she got to sleep next to the mummies. I guess things were very, very different back then, you know. And it wasn't that long ago, if you think about it. That's true, but the 90s weren't that long ago. But when you watch anything about the 90s, you're like, geez, you know? Yeah. That was just a totally different era. Era. <laughs> <Not> era. <laughs> era sometimes. That's true. Yeah. But tell me, you, you are very interested in Egyptian magic. Now tell me, where did this come from, this interest? Well, I think it, it came rather organically uh, through the study of my dissertation and subsequent book on foreigners in ancient Egypt and foreigner imagery. Uh, when you kind of take a deep dive into the ancient Egyptian worldview, uh, you see, first of all, um, that life is understood through a completely different lens then we understand our world around us. So, I mean, the, 
what's said most often is uh, we perceive the world um, in this kind of good versus bad dichotomy. Whereas uh, in a, a very overly simplified way, the ancient Egyptians saw things in a chaos versus order kind of way. Uh, but there are other aspects that are very different as well. One of them is this idea of Heka, um, which is, and the best way to interpret the word Heka is magic. Yeah. Um, but Heka is actually much, much larger and it's more broad. And it's this creative force in the universe that you can alter. So if Heka didn't exist, the world would not exist for the ancient Egyptians. And I mean, it's so ubiquitous and I don't know, so much of a point a part of how the Egyptians understood the world. For us, I, a kind of valid comparison would be like, how could the world exist without gravity? Like magic is something that's real and it's omnipresent yeah. and nothing can exist without it. Uh, so what the ancient Egyptians did is they believed that they could manipulate the world um, through this force. And you can see this in uh, imagery in their art. Um, what I focused on in my book is the imagery of the foreigner and the foreigners always being used kind of the imagery of the foreigners always used as kind of this voodoo doll, sympathetic magic where the king is like squishing it, uh, trampling upon it, um, uh, weighing upon it with his body to crush the foreigners to control the world. And it's not just an image of that to um, make the foreigners who are visiting the palace afraid, but it also works magically by him trampling and sitting upon these foreigners that acts in a magical component for him to actually crush and contain and destroy the foreigners in the world. Yes. So that's the part that I, that I don't know, that started this whole thing, <laughs> I'd say. Um, but then I started thinking of, I don't know how it relates to our Western concept of magic and how magic kind of has a, a negative valence. Yeah. Um, because ancient Egyptian magic, like you just said, it's not like I would perceive like, let's say Harry Potter with people running around with wands and things like that. It's a bit more political, religious, it's a totally different idea. It, it cannot, magic, if you read about, up about ancient Egyptian magic, it cannot be separated it is the same thing and cannot be separated from religion and medicine. So magic, religion, and medicine are the same thing in ancient Egypt. Um, so this ancient Egyptian magic turns into medicine, you know, in the Greco-Roman period or something like this. But at, in the Egyptian time period, they're very much intertwined. And religion also uses spells, you know, without the magic um, aspect, you can't have religion function, yeah. which is huge, right? If you, can't, if you can't pray to the gods, if you can't give to the gods, and those are all things involving Heka, then the world stops. If you don't believe that the solar, that the sun will rise, you know, that um, Apophis will be destroyed uh, through Heka the god, in, in his God form, then you then the sun won't rise again. So if you don't have a belief in magic, like you literally would think that the sun would not rise again in the morning if you were ancient Egyptian. Maybe I'm getting a little bit too in the trenches, but on a practical note, um, when I was researching this, bear in mind, I also have children um, and I'm living a life, you know, as a person on my own. Uh, so I like to do experiential teaching kind of things. Uh, so I, I did the research, I found the spells for ancient Egyptian magic and made a magic wand, <laughs> which helped my, my son uh, conquer his fear of uh, whatever, whatever evil lurks at night. So I'll show you my little reconstruction. And then it comes with a spell. It's a hobby of mine. I made make spells and how to use it. Wow, so they you would take made that? Similar. Huh? You made yeah. that? Yeah, see all the demons. It they looks lovely? like you stole that from the museum. 
Oh, well, I traced the little monsters from different various wands. And then that has a spell that says protection, let's see, protection by day, protection by night. Mm -hmm. And then you say the spell and you draw, the line. Um, draw a circle around yourself because you're encircling yourself for protection, yes. uh, which is a very common ancient Egyptian magical practice. That's why the king's name is in a cartouche mm -hmm. because it's a circle to protect him. Um, whereas normal people don't have that. Yeah. And I also, um, since I'm doing show and tell, do you mind me doing show and tell? I want to see everything. Okay. Uh, pandemic has been particularly hard. Um, I had a friend for everybody and I have a friend who was doing a good friend doing chemo who got COVID and she was in the hospital and I felt helpless. I felt utterly helpful, helpless. Um, so I thought, you know, what can I do to help? I could not do anything to help. She's very far away from me. So I did some research on the, the ritual of breaking the red pot. Oh yeah. You're familiar? I, w I was at a Greek wedding last week and they do similar things with the plates. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's actually, you put a, a thought onto it of something you wanna get rid of or break and then you break that and it's releasing it. So. I Very like cathartic. That very cathartic so yeah. I, I have here on i have here illness and then um on the one for her i put illness and then uh, it would be of person's name and then i would recite uh, i found that the um i found a spell that would go along with it and one of my i have sheets of papyrus that lead me through spells it's a very elaborate hobby um Anyway, and I broke it and I stamped on it and I spit on it in the appropriate ancient Egyptian way. Uh, and then I sent her the sherds in the mail. <laughs> and she's out of the hospital and doing quite well, but I'm, I'm not ascribing to ancient Egyptian magic. I'm just saying it felt great for me. <laughs> well, sometimes, you know, just breaking that part of that plate can actually, it's a mental thing. Or it's influencing Hekka if you're an ancient Egyptian, you know? <laughs> exactly. exactly. But I see it as a, a mindset. So, yeah. So if, you could, so if you could make one Egyptian spell become a reality, which one would it be and why? I think I've already done that. <laughs> I have a necklace. <laughs> Hold on. I have a necklace with a papyrus scroll. Um, they're called oracular ornaments. Yeah. Let's see. It's called an oracular or ornament. It was, um, and this is an actual spell worn as a necklace like this during the time of King Shabaka. And it's a spell to protect the wearer from all sorts of maladies. You know, it goes on and on. It's a very long spell, actually. I remember Hold you on. told me this before, but I didn't see it close up. Let's see. And it has to be tied in a knot because that is actually um, significant in ancient Egyptian magic as well, with you know knots and cording. And Vilika Vendrick did a great. Uh, I don't remember if it's an article or book on it. So oh, it has wow. this whole spell, and I just reworded it because. I'm not Hamarcus from, you know, the reign of Shabaka. Uh, so, it says, so it says this wearer on it um, and it's pretty ubiquitous, so. Yeah. So yeah, that's, sorry, that's a huge side tangent on like, you know, random stuff I do that's hobby related, that's ancient Egyptian and magic. Oh, and for my <laughs> students, this is a bit more academic. My three-year-old daughter, my daughter when she was three made this, but we also make fans in my classes because of wow. magical, yeah, magical material in ancient Egypt. But I do this uh, as workshops with uh, my university and other universities. Oh, wow, that looks, <laughs> wait, what is that though? It's a, it's a three-year-old's version of a hippo. I give away all of my done faience, which is a shame because it turns out so nice. And then you can see that the bottom side, which is not uh, exposed to oxygen, does not get the, um, the shiny aspect or the coloring. Yeah. It doesn't uh, rise to the surface and bind to create that, that beautiful 
color and shine that the ancient Egyptians appreciated this material for. Yes, yes. So anyway. And for, for everyone watching who don't know what faience is, can you explain to us? Oh yeah, faience, um, it's really a mixture of plant ash, silica, colorant, and I know I'm missing one, and silica, colorant, lime. And most of these things would be found naturally in the ancient Egyptian environment. Yes. And they would mix them together with water, it would create a kind of paste. And then you're kind of working with this material that's kind of clay-like, it's kind of toothpaste-y also. Yes. Um, and you put it in the, you wait a couple of days and then it grows these, this is probably TMI, but it grows these little spores and it looks like it has mold on it. It doesn't look like it turns out at all. It looks horrible. And you put it in the kiln and those little things that look like mold, that's a salt and colorant that rise to the surface of the object. And when it gets really hot, those little um, dots, they fuse together and create this really beautiful color and shine. And so in, uh, in ancient Egyptian, the word for faons is chehenet, which is that which shines or that which is scintillating. It's also the word that's used for ancient Egyptian planets or stars that shine in the sky. Okay. Because I, I just would, yeah, thank you for explaining that because a lot of people think it's a, a glaze that gets put on it, but it's not. So thank you. No, and it, it also looks a lot like turquoise, uh, uh, turquoise or lapis lazuli. So it can be used in the stead of turquoise or lapis lazuli, depending on which colorant you add. But it's a lot of fun. Yeah. So what is the strangest Egyptian spell that you've come across? The strangest ancient Egyptian spell that I've come across. Oh, but there are so many. Um, well, there was, there's one I had to read, I think about four or five times the other day because I thought I was reading it wrong. <laughs> but apparently <laughs> there, uh, okay, Seth is the god of chaos, right? In yeah. ancient Egypt. And in some obscure uh, papyri, there was a spell to destroy the son of Seth who is a crocodile in this reference. And the crocodile's name, and I don't know how you would pronounce this in ancient Egyptian, Maga? Okay. M-A-G-A. And I was like, I must be, I was reading Facebook. This is not. <laughs> so uh, I think that one, that one was, cause I had never ever heard of Seth, Seth's son, Mega. Anyway. Yeah. That one was the most bizarre to me. Hmm. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. So you have also published um, about ancient foreigners moving to Egypt. Is that as in immigrants? Why do you think people wanted to move to ancient Egypt? Well, I mean, Egypt was an extraordinary, well, my book, focuses on the new kingdom, which everyone, everyone loves to throw in the, the title of like the golden, the golden period of ancient Egypt. That's the time that we have Tutankhamun, Nefertiti, uh, Cle not Cleopatra, wrong period. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but wouldn't it be great if she were there too? And then we could just focus on this one period. No, um, Amenhotep the uh, third, and Hatshepsut, it's, it's a great period. And the, in the New Kingdom, we have a dominance in the region by Egypt um, as a world superpower. So obviously there's lots of work. Um, people are being brought in to work on various projects in ancient Egypt. Uh, and there's also kind of this interesting subgroup of the population, a very small elite subgroup of the population that travels uh, within the Mediterranean, these like um, ambassadors and ambassador attaches. Uh, and these are people that are represented in some of the tombs in Thebes. 
And I find these images to be some of the most fascinating, fascinating ones that come from ancient Egypt, uh, period, full yeah. stop. So that's what I wrote my book about. Why are foreigners chaos? Why are they symbols for chaos? And yet we get these, these foreigner images, these images of these elaborate foreigner motifs placed in these really elite um, ancient Egyptian tombs. Yeah. So, I mean, that's we, have, what I we have images of the Greeks arriving in Egypt with gifts from the 18th dynasty. We have images of the Egyptians going to other countries. We have Ramses, the second son, even being sent as a correspondent to um, the Hittites. So maybe it wasn't so much that they they saw them as chaos. It was just that they were a bit misunderstood the foreign. So it was chaotic to the Egyptians. I believe that it was actually royal propaganda versus real politic, you know? Uh, because when they're interacting, when the kings are interacting in the late Bronze Age, they write each other letters where they address each other as brother and yeah. they have this really wonderful relationship. They're intermarrying their daughters. Uh, they're sending each other huge gifts um, and they're very, being very kind and polite. Uh, and even, maybe the, chaos, was, maybe the chaos came from marriage. <laughs> no, no, I, I think it's definitely a within the empire, um, having an enemy really, it, it's a political tool that really motivates an internal base. Yeah. I mean, what he's doing is tapping into a really effective political tool um, that the king used and harnessed from like the dawn of ancient Egyptian time until pretty much the end of it. Yeah. Uh, but this is separate from the reality of the interactions with the elite foreigners um, and foreign emissaries and diplomats um, on the same hand. And it's, it's kind of a, a delicate balance because the foreign emissaries who are representing your brother king are coming to your palace where they're kneeling before a throne showing you, the king, Under the stepping feet. upon, sitting upon images of foreigners that represent you, who, you know, the person who's, who represent the person who's right in front of the king. So yeah. it's, it's got to be interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have Nefertari referring to Purahipa as her sister um, and the king of the Hittites referring to himself as the brother. So I don't think they were actually related. As you said, it's, it's just showing that the politics are actually quite good, maybe. Oh, yeah. I mean, we have the Amarna letters that, that yeah. um, illustrate this quite well. There's actually one letter uh, sent to Ramses that complains, hey, you know, uh, I think it was for the Battle of Kadesh, if I remember correctly. Hey, this was a draw, but um, someone just reported back to me that you've represented this huge victory on all your temple walls. Is this the truth? You know, the reality was quite different. I can't believe you're using this, you know, um, in, an, in, a, in a, you're representing fiction to your people, but that's exactly, what Egyptian kings did. I mean, that was their modus operandi, you know? I mean, Ramses gets a bad rap. It wasn't just him doing that. It was a lot of kings, so. No, yes, but Ramses just did everything in a much more grandiose kind of pompous. And I, there's a special place in my heart for Ramses. I know. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I kind of love that about him, but I would have hated to live during his time. Yeah. Yeah, like I know you and I both like Ramses II. Why do you think people give him such a hard time? Uh, well, I, I enjoy, I kind of like his um, bombastic uh, pompousness in hindsight. Mm -hmm. I think if I were living at the time, it would really annoy me, but I think with all of his monuments and statues where he represents himself as like the object being venerated. I think it's kind of amusing. I don't know. Yeah. I just imagine myself, I have a, I have a bit of a vivid imagination and I imagine what if I did that, you know? <laughs> what if I erected this giant monument and then like secretly 
I put my name in a rebus and it was actually a big monument to me. Like, I just think like, what kind of chutzpah <laughs> did he have? Exactly. What kind of man would he be in real life? Who could I, who could I imagine him to be like? Um, I just, honestly, I think it's really entertaining. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We get a lot of uh, but again, I, well. I wouldn't want my king to be like that. Oh, you wouldn't? No. How would you rule your kingdom? How would I rule my kingdom? I would be, I would be Hatshepsut. Mm -hmm. I would reign in peace um, and have lots of lovely foreign dignitaries come by and bring me lots of resin trees. <laughs> uh, and um, yeah, I would try to avoid war as much as possible and trade as much as I could. Okay, okay. I would, I would go the Ramses route. I would be like, my way or the highway. So. Uh... <laughs> well, let's hope, Curtis, <laughs> that if there's an, a new TV show called "Who's Going to Be Egypt's Next Pharaoh." <laughs> <laughs> God, I hope that never happens. That an Egyptian wins. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not it a good I just, I just like things done a certain way. We all do. So, all do. yeah. But if you could have lived in any ancient time, what would it, when would it have been? <sighs> Man, everybody has such bad hygiene at all different times. Bad hygiene. Oh. I thought they were super into keeping clean and. I mean, when was toothpaste invented? Toothpaste. That's the real question. I know they had it at the time of the nineteenth dynasty. Not, not for real toothpaste. Not for real toothpaste, but they had something. <laughs> like, like I would, I, I couldn't go. I. I am really hygiene oriented. I'm a very hygiene oriented person. Yeah. And I love digs as, as much as the next person, but I, I bring a whole assortment of hygiene related things when I go and, and don't have, you know, immediate access to a shower for a few days. Um, and running water that, you know, I bring lots of water with me. Uh, I don't know if I take the hygiene aspect out of it, that like kind of obsessive, I need to be clean thing out of it, a time that I would really like to live in. I mean, obviously I'd have to be in the top 1% because if you're in the other like 95% during all of history, life is awful. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, and the smell, the smells of history must have just been horrible, like in any period. Are we asking ancient Egyptians specifically? Yes, we're not talking like Pompeii with stuff going down the street. <laughs> Just asking. Um, hmm. Well, I always, I, I think I would like, oh, aesthetically, because I'm an art, aesthetically, if I just wanted to go around and enjoy beauty, mm -hmm. maybe late 18th dynasty, yes. Okay. Yeah, I really like just everything visually about the late 18th dynasty. Yeah. But I would I would have Talking to have somebody post Amarna. Oh, definitely post Amarna. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Too much turmoil there. I could exactly. handle. I think I don't think I would have lost it during the Amarna period. I would have run away. I would I would have viewed it as a cult and run away. Exactly. Exactly. Well, even one of the princesses ran away, so yeah, maybe, no, I'm not gonna make that joke. <laughs> no former life jokes. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, so you mentioned that your first trip to Egypt was when you were 19. Mm -hmm. What was that like? Oh, it was magic. It magic. was heaven magic. <laughs> it was a beautiful time to go. Um, I went on my own through the American University in Cairo. So I enrolled at AUC, which is how I got to meet Salima and take her class. Uh, since it was the semester post September 11th, my class was very small and we were all just um, very adventurous, I'd say. Mm -hmm. I actually got written out of the will. What? 
Yeah, I got, <laughs> I got written out of the will by my grandma for going. Um, it was a big argument because they thought I would die. Um, but it turned out to be the most lovely experience of my life, you know? Um, it was amazing. I traveled, I only scheduled classes from like Tuesday to Thursday, and then, you know, would just travel the rest of the time. So I felt like I got to see more of Egypt than, than a lot of Egyptians. Yeah. And my favorite place, my favorite place, not necessarily for the antiquities, um, was Siwa, which was very different in 2001 yeah. than it is now. Because it was cut off from the rest of Egypt uh, until the 1970s. Yeah, yeah. So they didn't get a po paved road out there until the 1970s. So they'd been a really isolated community with really interesting cultures yeah. um, out there. And, and a lot of ancient stuff still sort of around, some tombs in the mountains. I mean, stuff that we don't really know much about. Yes. Well, they have the Mountain of the Dead. And in the Mountain of the Dead, <laughs> this, when was my last trip there? I mean, oh, at least in the 2010s, yes, there were, there were just mummies everywhere in the Mountain of the Dead. Like... A lot of erosion was happening on the mountain of that of dead. Is that of when the you dead. got a good um, sniff of them. No, you, they didn't smell very strongly. In but it, you know, it was outside. It wasn't cooped in. You know, it was much more dry than it is inside a museum. Yeah. Um, but there were just mummies everywhere. It's yeah. a great place to go. Um, and then, the, you know, that's the place where Alexander the Great gets told from Amun, the god, because uh, Amun fun. talks to people. Huh? Uh, yeah. he, he gets told that he's the son um, of Amun at, at this temple. And so you're like, you're really in a place where history, like huge history happens. Yeah. yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. And I mean, if anything did happen to you in Egypt, you had Salima who was going to defend you, I'm sure, like. <laughs> All of my AUC teachers were, were wonderful. Yeah. I did actually have a professor who yelled at a guy at the Khan um, when he, yes, when he was tried to be inappropriate. And she called out the guy in the store in front of the entire, you know, all of the street vendors. Um, and it was, horribly embarrassing for me and probably way, way, way worse for him. Wow. But she, she definitely was very protective of her students, which was great. Good, good. So how many times have you been to Egypt now? Mm, three? three I've been three times, but I haven't been post um, uh, Arab Spring. Revolution. I haven't wow. been since. Then. That's quite a yeah. long time. You should you should get back. Well, I was supposed to, I had all the funding lined up to go that semester. So that trip got canceled. Uh, and it's just been a little while. And now we're under COVID. So Yeah, well, nothing's happening yeah. for anybody now. Nothing's happening for anyone. Yeah. No. So what do your kids think about the whole Egyptology thing? Um, they, uh, they think it's cool because I'll come to their schools and I'll do the fiance workshops or I'll make like these ancient Egyptian necklaces for them and their friends, uh, and, you know, answer mummy questions or whatnot, at least one day of the year. Um, so you're the cool mom. No, I'm the nerd mom. <laughs> Way cooler moms in, in all of my kids' classes. Um, but they don't get it like they're they don't understand or they're not they're not impressed by it that's for certain they they see there's perks they like when mom's on tv that's cool yeah um this is actually my son's room that i'm recording in uh so this is just like the normal harry burton king tut um imagery and he also has giant posters uh, one said, Lord Carnarvon grew impatient. Can you see anything, he asked. And the other says, yes, replied Carter. Wonderful things. Everywhere the glint of gold, which is what That's Howard Carter said. 
the 26th of November, 1922. That's and this is because the exhibition that you were involved in. Well, I was involved in creating the educational materials for the show when he was in utero. So that explains why all of this stuff is in his room. Yeah. So his name is Carter, um, but he doesn't think it's as cool as I think it is. <laughs> oh, well, I'm sure, yeah. I mean, how old is he? 11. 11, he's gonna grow into it. <laughs> yeah, but he's let, he's let me do all sorts of weird magical stuff for him. So that's been kind of fun. Oh, good, good. He loves so the fam. You need to take them to Egypt. That's your next mission. You have to take them there. Indeed. Then they'll be surely. Hooked. Yes, I'm. I'm sure they'd be hooked. And Carter would love tea, and so would his little sister Serafina. Yeah. That God, that sounds awful. Giving little kids sugary tea. Oh, I thought you meant queen tea. <laughs> oh no, I can't give anyone queen tea. I don't have her. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, what is an average day for Flora like? Oh, it depends on which some what point in the semester it is. Uh, but oftentimes I am getting classes ready, working on a project like um, either a TV series, getting coordinated with a TV series. I just found out I'm doing another one, which is a follow-up um, about Saqqara. Uh, I found that out yesterday, so that's Netflix. exciting. Yay. Um, so I'm preparing for classes, I'm responding to students, I'm reading Egypt Egyptological literature. Uh, if it's during virtual teaching time, I'm trying to learn whatever the fifth graders and first graders are learning. Um, doing math. And, yeah, doing the, the, the new math. Uh, just generally, um, or I'm doing my hobby, you know, the creative outlet of, of trying to apply uh, experiential magic uh, to the everyday world, which is really like my my outlet. Um, some people have art. This is what I have. So um, it's not a bad life. It's pretty nice. Yeah, yeah. So I love the reading and the writing. You you just and the teaching is the... not so bad either. Oh well, you just mentioned the, about the the new documentary series. What other new projects are you working on? Uh, well, I just found out about the do new documentary series yesterday and, uh, well, let's see. I don't find out about these things until about a month before they happen. Mm -hmm. So anything that's down the line, I won't know about until it's right about to happen. Um, but right now I'm just getting everything ready for the upcoming semester. Uh, teaching my art classes, ancient Near Eastern art, and another, I believe, um, art survey, and uh, getting my syllabi ready and putting everything online and preparing for either uh, online or in person. Right now, we're planning on going in person, but it might have to be a hybrid. So, this really new and interesting reality that we're all living in, trying to figure out how how to function. Um, how to function during COVID. Yeah, yeah. Because you and I hadn't met before all of this happened. Um, so then you participated in the Nefertari documentary. So yeah, this year has been interesting, but good in some ways. Yeah, I, hey, I've made a new friend. <laughs> Thanks for <laughs> reaching out to me, Curtis. I appreciate it. You're probably sick of staring at Ed Burton and my son's desk, but I appreciate um, you reaching out and you recorded your, your lockdown video for the documentary. Oh, yes, it is. Yeah. It's my site. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How does he feel about you using the room? Uh, he's fine as long as he's not in it. <laughs> oh, okay. So I tend to schedule anything that's recording an interview, um, when they're not here because otherwise you would see flying airplanes and like i'm surprised the dogs haven't they're resting quietly um here hold on hello <laughs> i've got my little accomplice oh. i have another one that she's sweeping kind of looks like a gremlin 
These are my muses. So what is your <laughs> proudest moment of your career? I really, I quite liked, let's see, proudest moment of my career. I quite liked uh, publishing a book uh, with Bloomsbury uh, in a series edited by Nick Reeves. Oh, wow. Um, and so quickly after I finished my dissertation, that that was big for me um, because the Duckworth series, the series that my book is in, is one um, that I knew well and uh, I was very interested in. So he said, would you be interested in publishing this? And I really didn't look elsewhere. So I was very excited to get my book published there. Well, I, I think it that's a very big Oh yeah, it was a very nice, it was a very nice thing to do for sure. Yeah. yeah. And it's, my book is more of a reference book, so I'm hoping it'll stay around a little bit. Okay, good. We always need more of, more of those. <laughs> more indexing, lots of indexing. Exactly. Lots of cataloging. <laughs> well, Flora, I have loved chatting to you. Thank you so much for joining for the interview. Before I end, I just have a few quick fire questions that I, always ask at the end, just to end on a high note a little bit. So, um, and after we've got the quick fire questions, if there's any questions from the audience, um, please get your questions ready. So when we're done with those, you can ask Flora some questions. So are you ready, Flora? I'm ready. Okay, favorite place in Egypt? Siwa. Favorite artifact? Oh my. Tut sandals with the foreigners. Hmm. Favorite pharaoh? I'll, I'll go with Ramses, the good, second. Good girl. Good girl. <laughs> Favorite queen? No, no, Cleopatra, Cleopatra. I changed my mind. Cross no, that she's out. She's coming up. She's coming up. Favorite queen? Cleopatra. There we go. You see. Can have two. Six. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite place apart from Egypt? Puerto Rico. Okay. Um, Tutankhamun or Ramses? Oh, that would really depend on if I'm, you're asking me a research-based question. Like Tut has so much wonderful stuff. I'd have to go with Tut. But who do I find more interesting? Ramsey's had a hundred children. How could you not go with that? Exactly, exactly. Busy guy. Very busy guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and his offspring, Kamwaset, he was the greatest magician in ancient Egyptian history. That's fascinating. Exactly. Magician, historian. Prolific as heck kind of guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Where do you think he got that? that confidence from? Um, being the pharaoh of Egypt and thus uh, the most uh, divine person on the planet. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> According to his own ideology. <laughs> yes. Well, Flora, thank you so, so much. I really appreciate it. It was so fascinating getting to know more about you, about magic and all the great things that you offer us. So thank you. Thank you for having me, Curtis. Curtis, I really appreciated it. And this was a lot of fun. It's always fun chatting to you, so thank you. I know, likewise. So if we have any questions from the audience, ask them now, unmute and ask, go. I'll ask a quick question, even though I have many. <laughs> um, I, I have tended to be more on the esoteric side of the magical part of things of ancient Egypt and only within the last couple of years been very drawn to learning more about like the actual people and um, their ancient practices, just daily life and who they were and who's the Pharaoh of what dynasty and 
like the history of it. I'm, I'm wanting to find that, I guess, as you would say, the ma'at in my Egyptian studies so that it's all very balanced. Um, but when you were talking about doing the magic spells, and I loved the wands that you made, by the way. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, the so when you're talking about spells, like in my mind, I think of like the Egyptian Book of the Dead, because all of those are called spells. I think of all of the things on the coffin text. You know, I love reading through all of those. Are those the spells that you're using, or do you have other resources or places in which you find those? No, I dig a bit deeper. Um, so I'll be looking at um, like. I don't know, Ptolemaic papyri translations and databases. Um, but I could recommend a few books. Yes, please. But I mean, really, you just have what I've done to do these kind, find these kind of general spells is to just really read through just volumes and volumes of medical spells mm -hmm. and religious spells. And um, uh, I don't think. To my knowledge, there isn't. Uh, there's a couple books on magic you want might want to check out. Uh, one is by Robert Rittner. Um, he's very much on the kind of academic end of things. Another is, I believe, by Geraldine Pinch, um, and it's lovely, and you should really check it out. Uh, but there's also another good book. Let's see. You might want to check out this one. Okay. And I like this one. It's less academic, but it's more, it's a kind of a fun read. Okay. Um, but you know, with Egyptian stuff, it's really hard when you're looking at ancient Egyptian magic because there's just so much malarkey out there. <laughs> so you want to go like- yeah right to the source because so right. many people, that's what like, I was that. asking for mm -hmm. yeah that's what I was asking for is, is those sources because I'm I'm wanting I'm finding myself wanting I'm always in the bibliographies of everything so <laughs> when you're talking about indexes I'm like yes more indexes um so we can see all <laughs> like where do we need to go so um those are a great book um because I need more books of course always Yes. Um, I mean, so, until your house is packed, you need more books. Yeah. So you can yes. really walk away. You need more books. <laughs> yeah, I know it. I know it. Our own little uh, libraries of Alexandria in our homes. So beautiful. Um, and I have more questions that I can get with you later so other people can ask. But thank you so much. It was really wonderful to, to meet you here on Zoom. Thanks. It was lovely to meet you too. Thanks for coming. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Osset. And I hope that you are feeling better soon. So we're thinking about- Yes, I, I hope so too. I just feel very weak right now. So it'll be nice to feel stronger, but thank you. This was like a highlight of my day. <laughs> oh, thank Thanks. you for joining. Anybody else have a question for Flora? Um, I've got one here. Um, I'm from South Africa and we don't really have much in the way of like tertiary education that's useful for people who have an interest. And I'm also very realistic because I don't have a hell of a lot of time. I'm a freelancer and I'm an author and I'm really just trying to dig deep into Egyptological, ugh, Egyptological research at the moment for my writing. But um, I was wondering if you've got any um, suggestions of online resources that are good for distance learning. Um, yes, the online Egyptological bibliography right now is open to the general public uh, when it usually is not. So it's, it's open because of COVID and because people aren't associated with their universities um, as, they, as many people aren't right now. Um, so if you go to the OEB, online Egyptological bibliography, um, it's basically Google for ancient Egyptian references. So, I mean, you can type in clothing and, and it'll look up clothing in French and German and um, all the languages um, and pull up all the resources that, you know, have to do with clothing. And then you can filter further th through there. And that's really an extraordinary- um, <laughs> That's huge. Data. 
Yeah. It's huge. <laughs> okay. And it's rabbit hole. Right yeah. yeah. And um, if it's after <clears throat> post post COVID, obviously, then there's a membership fee or something like that. Yes, oh, there is. It's doable. Thank you. <laughs> so, so, so go look up everything right now and print it off. <laughs> <laughs> Put it in a Word doc so you have very small small font. Thanks, Noreen. <laughs> I think we have time for a few more questions. I see Marissa is online. She's very quiet. I'm usually not quiet, but <laughs> hi, Flora. My name is Marissa. Hello. And I, I don't have a question, but I understand. I also, I live right outside of New York City and I have um, nine-year-old twins. So I'm also that mom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm mom too. So I get you. <laughs> it's, it's, it's fun being a quirky mom, you know, like, and every time there's a Halloween event at my kid's school, someone is dressed like a Nefertiti and comes running up to me. Mm -hmm, so. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just get her pretty much when I teach at least once a day, I walk around the house with it. Sometimes I put my toga on just to confuse everyone. Oh, I don't even have a Nemes headdress. That's lovely. I've got like eight. I'll send you one. <laughs> Great. <laughs> really nice. Yeah. It is a nice one. Partycity.com. Get it after Halloween when it's on sale. <laughs> I've, I've, got, um, I've got my kufiya, which I convert into a nemes when I need to dress up. So it's like the white one. So I, I actually dress like, I, I've been told that I dress as if in, I were an ancient Egyptian living in modern times. So lots of white drapery, um, things that look like broad collars, but are modern, but uh, weird gorgeous, stuff. So, hmm? Those are gorgeous, so wear it. Gracias, thank you. <laughs> so I think we have time for one final question. Um, I see Percy is online and Jill and a couple others, so. Usually Jill there's, a question. Question. there's a question asking how to become an Egyptologist. Um, do I have any advice for college? Which I can respond to um, in the chat section. Oh, yes, I see. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, if you're planning on becoming an Egyptologist, um, you have a large trust fund. I hope. <laughs> and if so, then proceed uh, and go. The first things that you're going to, the first obstacles you're really going to have to overcome um, are reading in French and German. Uh, so you won't really want that under your belt if possible um, during your senior year of undergrad when you apply to, gra uh, to graduate programs. Um, and also an internship at a museum or something like that would be very helpful. Uh, taking, figuring out kind of which way you want to go, which approach you'd like to take in Egyptology, either art historical, linguistic, um, or archaeological might also help um, figure out which road you want to go down, down um, in the Egyptological world. We use all of those, we have to learn all of those methodologies, but typically we're a specialist in one of them. So for instance, I study images and I have an art history um, PhD. Um, so uh, in college, I would kind of, you know, either focus in archeology span or art history or linguistics as much as you can with ancient languages or ancient Egyptian languages, whatever your, um, or ancient Egyptian iconography or archeology span or archeology span in general. Um, that's what I did because my uh, university for the first three years did not have an Egyptologist. So I worked on um, Southwestern archeology span stuff with the uh, idea of eventually wanting to do uh, Egyptian archeology. span so, um, but I, I hate to deliver the news, but you'll probably have to learn to read French or German. Um, and, and when you're applying to grad schools, that does mean a lot. It means that you're willing to invest a lot of time and that you're a very serious student. And also keep your grades up. Mais tu parles français, Flora. Oh, it doesn't mean I can speak French. It only means I can read French. Mais pourquoi? <laughs> Big difference. Tu <laughs> parler. 
I, I, I can all, it's like, <laughs> like Spanish. <laughs> I can read it. I can understand it, but to speak it would absolutely kill me. I would die. I'll teach you. It's okay. <laughs> I see uh, Bryce has also asked um, tips on learning French or German during the pandemic. There is a really good app called Duolingo. Um, it's free and you go on every day and you do little exercises and you can just learn conversational things. You won't learn the full language, but it helps a lot. May I recommend that you see if there is a graduate level reading in German or reading in French that you can um, take or even audit uh, if you want to audit and try to pass the exam so that the teacher can write a, a letter of recommendation for you uh, because that will really show that you've put work into it. Yes, um, the, the certificate, yeah. But, but Duolingo is great for like trying to immerse yourself in it and learn more about the language and that kind of stuff. And I fully encourage um, jumping into other languages, although I hate doing it myself. <laughs> Not a linguist. <laughs> God bless them. Exactly. Well, I speak five languages, so I like languages. <laughs> How good are all of your languages? I think I speak, I think my Arabic uh, is conversational, which means I sound like I'm in first grade. I know Something like, like I know like four words in Arabic. It's like, Salam, salamu alaikum, shukran, afwan, maya man fadlak. Do you means... want to hear the phrase I say the most uh, yeah. when getting bothered by people in Egypt? Tell me. An harmi gazma fuwashik wallahi lazim. I'm going to throw my shoe in your face, I swear to God. <laughs> you have to write that down. <laughs> it's a good post. one. Or eh, terem nafsak, which is watch your morals, which is very offensive, apparently. Yeah, they're very moral, so. But if someone's getting handsy, that's what they're gonna get. Okay, okay. <laughs> oh. Anyway, I think we have received all of our questions from the audience. I'm gonna give opportunity for one more question if there is, if there isn't, I think we are are good, so I'll give a three second gap. All right, I think we have all the questions done from the audience. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Curtis. Thank you, Flora. Thanks, Thank Marissa. You. So Marissa and I will be doing an interview um, at the end of January, I think the 29th of January. So tune in for that. Um, and on Sunday, I will be interviewing Dr. Tarek Taufik. Um, we'll be talking about the Grand Egyptian Museum and things like that. So should be very interesting. And yes, the Bethany Hughes doc interview is coming up in January and a whole bunch of other interesting things. So. Yes. Look forward to it, Curtis. Thank what you. What time so is it, Curtis? Are you going to let us know on Facebook or? Yes, yes. They will. They will be published on Facebook. So. Okay. Cool. Write yeah. down. And um, <laughs> I'm doing also an interview with uh, Stephanie Jarvis in January, which um, is not necessarily Egyptian themed, but um, she has been there. She has studied. She's very much into. Ramses II as well. Um, it will be more about French culture, the chateaus, things like that. So tune in for that. Great. Great. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for joining. Thank you so much, Flora, for taking the time to speak to us today. Of course, it was lovely. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. And you keep well, look after those kids. Um, keep being the cool mom. <laughs> I'll try to be that now. <laughs> if if they if they disagree, tell them I say you're the cool mom. I will. Okay. All right. Thank you. Goodbye. Did you hear Thanks that? So much, everyone. With cool moms. <laughs> <laughs> the cool mom, Flora.
<laughs> so not cool. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> Other magic wands. I have magic wands, son. <laughs> I have artifacts. Nobody cares. Coins. No one cares. I we care. We're the only ones that care. <laughs> I appreciate you. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks everyone. You, Marissa. Bye everybody. Bye. 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 Happy Christmas. Happy holidays. Yes. Happy Christmas and happy holidays to everybody. And we'll be soon. We'll be chatting soon. Bye. Stay safe. Bye.